Hey, good evening, and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum 2022. And we're preparing for town meeting day on the 1st, and we're having candidates, we're talking about the issues, we're talking about the capital budget, we're talking about the school budgets, we're talking about parks, cemeteries, and even the safety authority. And tonight we have a school board candidate, Will Alexander has come to visit. Welcome. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for having me. Will, why are you running for the school board? Why? I mean, that is, that is a thankless task. It is. Um, God, I've, got, I've got sort of two tracks of reasons. There's the, the gut instinct reasons and the practical ones. Um, my, the most basic answer is that I've got kids in the district. I've got um, one child in the elementary school, one in the middle school. Um, the health and well-being of the schools and the school system are um, a point of immediate importance. Um, but it's also it's also very much part of my career. I mean, I how I, so? I teach here. Well, we're on campus right now. We're on, um, at VCFA, and I teach at the Vermont College um, program for writing in writing for children and young adults. Um, I was until recently. I just finished up a. A, um, a term as faculty chair of that program. And it's an amazing program. I mean, it's the oldest and best of its kind. Oldest um, in what sense? It, the first graduate program in specifically focused on and devoted to writing for young audiences. Um, so you would find classes and maybe a concentration in that in other graduate programs, other writing programs, um, but a whole program, a whole degree program devoted just to that. Um, is this was the first. When did you write your first book? When did, it came out, I wrote it over several years um, in a messy rambling process, um, but it came out in 2012. So, so I've been a novelist for officially for 10 years. What was the book about? What was the book about? Um, it's, a, it's a fantasy novel. Um, it's uh, for middle grade audiences. So, you know, eight to 12. It says eight to 12 on the cover. Um, and it's a fantasy book about a goblin theater troupe. So sort of, you know, fantasy Muppet show <laughs> kind of book. Um, I was in theater way back when, and then I, I, I wanted to pour everything I knew and loved about theater into a book. Um, it did okay. I mean, it, uh, this is still weird to say out loud, but it, it won the National Book Award that year. So, um, so I got okay, what is the National Book Award, and how does it differ from the cult? cult? The, the Caldecott, or the, the Newberry, Caldecott or, or the um, Newberry? What oh, are the three awards? What are the awards? Um, and the okay, the, the big awards, the big awards in children's literature are the Caldecott and the Newberry, and they are, um, I mean, the two most famous, and they are judged by librarians. Um, they're uh, um, they're one of the, two of the many. Um, big, magnificent awards um, that ALA hands out every year. ALA um, being? A, the uh, American Library Association. Uh, the, the National Book Award is distinct from, the, from a lot of the other big awards in, um, in American Letters in that the judges, almost all of the judges, are other writers. Um, most of the children's literature awards are judged by librarians, because, I mean, and they very much know what they're talking about. Um, the National Book Awards in every category are judged primarily, though not entirely, by other writers. Other writers in the children's field or just other writers? Other, other writers in that category. So in, in my category, yes, they were other children's book writers. Susan Cooper was one of them, um, Gary Schmidt. Um, now, I've, I've judged it since. Now in 2012, mm -hmm. you look back, it's a decade now. Yeah. How does that book read to you now? Um, well, I haven't read it um, <laughs> recently. Uh, my kids seem to like it, which is nice. It's, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of, um, I'm proud of what it has apparently accomplished. And it reads, I mean, I'm a, okay, the author who, here we go, here's my answer. The author who shaped my brain more than anyone else um, when I was that age, when I was 11 years old. Um, and we're, we're so often writing for, we're writing the books we needed then. We're writing, um, we're writing for what we needed at that age. Um, and the author 
who shaped my brain more than anyone else when I was 11 um, was Ursula K. Le Guin. And You're aiming high. Yeah, I'll, I mean, always. Um, and she is, and we lost her in, in 2018, um, and, and she was a friend and mentor, and something she, she kept returning to throughout her magnificent career um, was the idea that fantasy um, is, it's important for many reasons, foundationally because it, by its nature, offers an alternative to the way things are. It, um, it proves that things do not have to be the way they are. And simply by playing out that imaginative exercise, that spending time with dragons, um, it requires that we imagine a different world. And those mental muscles are necessary to create a different world, to, to never get stuck in the assumption that the way things are, however they are, is the way that they have to be. Um, and so that's one of the that is one of the great strengths of fantasy in any in any medium in any form or subgenre. Um, it is necessary, and we're hungry for it. We're always hungry for it. We're especially hungry for it when the world is in various ways terrible, um, because it helps us imagine alternatives and then helps us create those alternatives. How many books followed that book? Um, so far, I've got six out in the world. Are they all for middle school? Uh, yes, they are all middle grade. They all say 8 to 12 on the cover. Are they all fantasy based or is there? Some are science fiction. None of them are realism. <laughs> I am incapable of realism. I've, I've tried. Ghosts show up every time. It's... Have you experienced districts that don't like the notion of science fiction? Occasionally. Or parents who feel that science fiction is inappropriate? From time to time, we have those conversations. I mean, not too often, because usually the people who ask me to come speak are the ones who like what I'm doing. But, but I'll, have, I'll have healthy debates with, um, with a different stance on um, the value of different modes of storytelling for kids. As a chair of a, a department that's helping people to author those books. Mm -hmm. You become somewhat of an authority, I suppose, on the book wars. Ah, the book wars, um, which in a way brings us back to school boards. Okay, would you uh, open on that? Uh, How do you counsel people to avoid the, the book wars? Or do you counsel people, How do I counsel people? On, those, on those topics? I do. I mean, I've counseled many students um, who are who are embarking on controversial subject matter. Or what would be a controversial subject matter? Well, at the moment, I mean, any the books currently being banned. Um, thankfully, knock on wood, not nearby, but um, but in in the national news, a, a part of the national debate, um, in which school boards and school libraries um, come up. There, there have been a number of book bannings um, lately. Notably, um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse uh, was banned in Tennessee. Would you explain what Mouse is about? I Ma know what it's about, but there might be people who don't. Mouse is um, a graphic novel. I believe the first, well, graphic memoir, technically. It is, it is nonfiction. I believe it was the first to win the Pulitzer, the first in its medium, the first book of its kind uh, to win the Pulitzer Prize. It is a memoir of the Holocaust and of the author's father's experience um, as a survivor of the Holocaust um, in Germany. It's also, um, it is factual in content, um, but fantastical in, in its art form in that um, characters are portrayed as animals, are drawn as animals. And, um, Principally what animals? Mice. Um, well, the Nazis are cats and Jews are portrayed as mice. Um, and Mouse in German, M-A-U-S, is the title. Um, what are people objecting to? Oh, <clears throat> they're um, on its surface. The charge is um, supposedly obscenity. There, um, 
Um, obscenity in a different way than the death of six million people mm -hmm. being obscene. There's a little bit of nudity, and okay. apparently that's a problem. Um, that's, I mean, I have my doubts <laughs> about whether that's actually the reason. Um, there's, broadly speaking, um, when you look at the books, the totality of the books, the dozens and dozens of books, there's a document um, put together by uh, local politicians in Texas of a spreadsheet of many, many, many books being challenged in schools. Um, there are very clear common threads. What would those be, in your opinion? Um, books, books that give a history of oppression of any kind, of persecution of any kind, um, American history, uh, questions about, I mean, about the Civil War in particular, um, the history of people of color, um, primarily in the United States, um, books by or about black people, constantly banned, constantly pulled, constantly taken off the shelves and forcibly removed from curriculums, um, books by or about queer people, LGBTQ people constantly banned, pulled from shelves, either loudly or quietly removed from where students can see them, where students can find them. And this has recently become increasingly less subtle. <laughs> I mean, it was never subtle, but it's, it's getting less and less subtle in its blatant um, targeting of particular voices, particular demographics. If a parent were to come to our library, our librarian, or to the school board, to come to Libby, to our mm -hmm. superintendent, and say, I don't want my child accessing this book that's in the library. Now, we're not talking about any child. Mm -hmm. We're only talking about my child. As a school board member, how would you address that? What counsel would you give Libby? What counsel would I give Libby? Well, this is, okay, complicated question because, and I have a lot of faith in this, there's... It wouldn't be up to me in any individual solo way. Like there are, um, there is a whole community and a whole professional institution in place of the school librarians and the schools okay. and mutual support. And, um, and but if I've, we're not talking about the general population at the middle school, okay, we're talking about my child. Uh -huh. I don't want my child to have access to that. Mm. If that if that person were to appear at the school board, what would you say? That sounds like an issue between them and their child. Okay. Um, and that if, as with any other, if you would prefer your child to not watch a particular TV show, that is a family issue and that is an issue of parenting and that's an issue of boundaries um, to be discussed with your child and enforced as best you can. Um, but there's, there's a very important principle at work generally. Um, your rights end where mine begin. Could you elaborate on that, please? Um, once your rights end where mine begin, your, once your sense of your rights begins to intrude on other people's and begins to have consequence for other people, begin to restrict other people. I mean, if I choose to be a vegetarian for ethical reasons, um, I don't have any say on what your lunch is. Um, there are a number of ethical spheres where um, my rights end where yours start. And the moment you try and take books away from anybody else, the moment you start pulling books off of school libraries um, or uh, removing them from classrooms or forcing teachers to take them out of the curriculum, um, that's, that is a horrific line. That is um, many of our worst moments um, included that impulse as a symptom. Could you imagine the school board supplementing material, not taking the books away? And let's go to history, for instance. Hmm. Uh, we're using history books that are widely used across the United States and are purchased, I suppose, based on California, Texas, those things. When the book, when parents were, if parents were to come to the school board and say that the depiction of Texas history is inaccurate, mm. you know, it just, that particular depiction is inaccurate, 
would you see the school board asking that supplementary materials be provided to our teachers that would make this? Are, are we going to deconstruct history in order to make it more representative to our community? Is that where we're going? We are always doing that. There's no avoiding that. I mean, just generally. We're, we are always re-examining history and noticing what has been left out. But the books are static. Not always. There are new editions of the books. I mean, this, is, this isn't, like at the moment, this is a screaming match in many parts of the country. Thankfully, I have not heard screaming here. So, so a lot of this is very, very hypothetical. Um, but this is, uh, this is always a conversation. What, what we focus on when we tell our history and what we leave out um, and what we do deliberately and what we do unconsciously. And what have we been doing unconsciously when we bring that to our conscious attention? Um, we're always doing that. That is, that is the business of teaching history, talking about history, um, of making sense of where we came from. So we're never not doing that. And we should be doing that. We should always be doing that. And, that's, and we're always doing that as a community, as, as a town, as a city, as a, as a state, as a nation, as a world. Um, what, what should we focus on when we consider our identity over time um, is a huge question. And we're never not doing that. Um, and th the school board has a role in, in that as it plays out in schools. Um, but it's part, of a, it's part of a much bigger conversation. Well, the school board actually has a committee on that called the uh, District-Wide Visioning Committee. Indeed. Are you following the district-wide visioning committee at all? Uh, I am, broadly, from a distance. Um, uh, I do know some of the people working on it. Um, I think it's important work. What would you do? If, if you were put on that, what, what would you bring to the table? Um, the first thing I would do is listen, because this is, um, this is a group. This is a committee. This is um, a group of people working together as a team. So I don't, like the role I'm running for isn't a leadership role. Um, it is. Well, in a sense it is. In a sense it is. Um, in, in terms of the whole community, yes. But it's, a, um, you know, I'm not running for school board president. Um, I'm, I'm joining this group of people that cares very passionately about this. So the first and most important duty, the first thing I would do would be to listen to everyone else on the committee, everybody else on the board, and, and I know this is increasingly a priority for the school board in a really positive way, just listening to the community. I mean, they've been um, doing really excellent work in finding new ways to hear the community and to hear the community concerns. Um, so that's a long way of saying the first thing I would do is listen. Um, then what I would bring to that table is um, knowledge of the book world, um, knowledge of children's publishing, knowledge of fiction and nonfiction. I mean, my particular specialty is fiction, but as, I mean, as faculty chair, the former faculty chair of, um, of this program, I've had to stay abreast of children's publishing and children's writing in every genre, um, which includes history books, which includes textbooks. Where did you live before Montpelier? I lived, well, for a while in Minneapolis, which is um, another, another locus of, of children's writing. There are a lot of great um, writers and children's book writers in As well as theater. As well as theater. It's a fantastic theater town. It's a really good restaurant town and music town. Um, it's a good town. Minneapolis is, is, is a great town. Um, and uh, I was there. We went out there um, for my wife's master's program, and we stayed for several years. Um, and, but I have bounced all over the place. I mean, I've lived, I, I'm, I was born in Miami. I've lived every which place. Um, but your wife has Vermont roots. She does. Her father's, her father's a Vermonter, um, though now lives, his, her mother's from Montreal, and her parents now live in Montreal. Um, what but, made you choose Montpelier? Montpelier? And what was your first impression of Montpelier? Oh, I love this town. Um, it's... I, I chose Montpelier because Vermont College is here. 
Um, and th this, is, this is where I teach. This is where, um, this is where, this is where my career has led me. Um, How old were your children when you moved to Montpelier? Young, <laughs> very young. Um, two and five? Yes, two and five. Um, so they've both been through the school district starting in kindergarten. Um, they both had Mrs. Mello as a kindergarten teacher. Um, what was your impression of Union um, when you came here and at two and five? I loved it. Every, what was the about, strength of Union to you? I, well, initially, just the reputation of it. I mean, we knew we were moving to the area generally, but um, because of the college, because being, you know, being close to the college was the goal. Um, but were we, were we going to be in this district was an open question. And one of the first things as moving... Could you find a place yeah, in Mount and Hillier? Exactly. Could we find a place? Um, and that was the search. That was a long search. Um, and did we want to be in the district? Um, and the, the question there was the schools. Was like, we, we're coming here with young kids. What are the schools like? And I heard nothing but good things about... What were you hearing about the schools? Um... From the outside? From the outside um, and from friends who were already in town and, and who their kids had gone through. Um, God, what were the specifics? I remember the glow. I remember the, just the, all oh, the schools are great. Like that was, that was just a general, the, the schools are great. People are there, they're well run, the teachers are amazing. Um, there's a lot of community support for the schools um, and the community involvement is very high. Um, and that the teachers are outstanding. Is... Now you're in it. You you've gone through with one child through union. You're in, mm -hmm. uh, you're in, MSMS right now. Um, what's the strength of union? Now that you've been a parent and you've sat and gone to the parents' conferences, you've gone through the entire experience. What is the strength of Union Elementary from oh. that perspective? How do I pick just one? Um. Well, right now, in the middle of constant crisis right, right. and upheaval, um, I'd say they, like, the strength is, how, I mean, how do I even distill this quality? Um, nimble, adaptable, flexible, able to, the, the adaptability, the strength of being able to roll with astonishingly volatile circumstances and maintain focus on the students and what they need and making sure that they get what they need. Um, What's the curricular strength of Union from a, your parents' perspective? The curricular strength? Yeah, is it math, is it humanities, is it science? Um, I've been oppressed across the board. Um, I, I have, I mean, my, my own expertise being what it is, I um, am particularly focused on reading and a love of reading, a love of discovery, a love of narrative, regardless of where that sense of narrative is applied. I mean, f for me at least, everything is story. And, and what impresses me most is, which I've, seen, I've, which I've seen in every teacher, is a really strong sense of narrative that communicating the story of why something is important. Um, Communicating the story in the context and 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 the kids' role, the students' role in their own stories, in the stories that they're building and the stories that they're participating in. Um, there's a very strong narrative sensibility um, to the teachers that I've always appreciated. For kids who are behind mm. or are learning disabled or whatever, do you get a sense that that union? is really out there for them in, a, in the best way that it could be. Uh, every year when you get your test results, the school board comes back and says, we, we really need to do a better job with our low-income kids or, and our kids who are behind and the like. With okay. COVID, the kids who are behind probably got really behind. Yes. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on how to get those kids who are really behind mm. back up to merely, not only merely being, you know, a little behind, but getting them up towards that, that median? I think it, it is always about, I mean, your first question was, are we doing the, the best that we can? Um, we probably are, for these you kids. know. Um, no, I, well, we probably are, but also we never are. We're never, there's always something better. 
There's always. I think we're doing an. I think the schools are amazing. Um, there's always. We can always learn and change and grow. We can always improve. We can always l like realize that we've that something has just been a, a horrible oversight. That there are things we should be addressing that we haven't been. There's always that possibility. Um, so, um, like. So from that perspective, we're never doing the absolute best that we can. Um, there's, there's always going to be room for improvement. And, and finding that out and supporting it um, is always a role of, of, any, of anyone working in any school administration role. Um, these helping kids, helping kids who have been particularly affected by, by the pandemic or the structure of the schools who whose needs have not been met, whose educational needs have not been met. Um, the role is just is understanding that context. I mean, not leaping to too quick a conclusion. Aha, you're struggling. You need this. I mean, maybe not. Like if you, if you run in with a quick diagnosis um, and a quick prescription, then that might, that might, anything hasty like that might be an inadequate understanding of the needs of that that student, that context, where they're at, how, um, what they need to move forward in their education. So just more effort, um, research, listening, talking to parents, talking to the community, reading the studies, reading. And all of, a lot of this is new. The actual consequences of the pandemic on students developmentally is something we're going to be studying for decades. Um, but what do, we, what do we understand of that so far? And how can we address it is going to be a constant question. How does the school district best communicate, not with you, mm. but with me, with the community of people who do not have kids in school anymore, whose kids went through our public schools, who aren't sitting on the school board for the most part? Uh -huh. How do you best communicate with those people who aren't showing up at the meetings, mm -hmm. um, who are watching this? Who are watching this? Um, well, doing this um, and uh, and and outreach is important. In improving communication between the board and the the, the schools um, and the district is really important and a big priority. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the board is already doing this. I mean, they're already there are listening sessions. There are. There which is, are predominantly parents. Which are predominantly parents. Um, but there is outreach. There is outreach and communication. Um, I mean this right here, um, like talk, um, getting in front of the camera, getting on the radio, getting, um, doing interviews, um, doing news stories, getting in the newspaper, um, being upfront and transparent about what we're doing and why we think it's important um, is always part of the job. It's always part of the task. We gained 14 students last year. Mm -hmm. Were unions supposed to lose students? Montpelier High School will actually gain some, but it's going to peak in 25. That's what the budget projects. OK. Yes. What do we do? <laughs> I mean, how do we stay uh, short of um, Savings Pasture picking up people, picking up housing, perhaps at the Elks Club picking up mm. housing. How do we keep a district afloat like this with half teaching positions and the like? That's the big question. Um, there's no one answer to it. It is, and there are weirder factors at play now than, than there have ever been. The, the, the pandemic, um, the funding, the emergency funding that only comes with the pandemic. I mean, there are the budget and the logistical considerations um, are more in flux and with more factors than is usual in a given academic year. Um, so how there, I don't have one answer to that question, and I don't believe that there is any one answer to that question. Um, I think the best way to address that, um, those shifting numbers, shifting dynamics, and a whole domino cascade of logistical challenges that come with it. Um, there are also opportunities, always, um, w with any of those shifting 
dynamics and the role of any new member of the school board. Um, You're the junior member. Yeah, the junior member. Um, will be to listen and engage with everybody else who's been you know, neck deep in it so far um, and just find out what's possible. And that, I mean, that kind of work, while, while I don't have an answer to that specific question because I'm not in it yet, um, that kind of work is the work that I have been doing for years. I mean, as working here at the college, um, the pandemic had a very big effect on um, the structure of our program, what we were able to do, what we had been doing, how, and adaptation, um, shifting to the shifting the structure of our program and and how to ensure that we were still able to get our students what they needed um, given wildly different circumstances um, that's what I've spent most of the past that's what everyone in education wherever they are has spent the past couple of years doing um, and that's what I've been doing here at the college um, and so that work that constant logistical reassessment. What, what do we have? What are the resources? What are the limitations? What are the challenges? And what has changed in the past 24 hours that changes all of those things? Um, how do we adjust? How do we adapt? Um, that's, that's what I've been doing. That's what the schools here have been doing. Um, that's what, regardless of who is on the school board, um, whether I am or not, I know that that's what the board will continue to do. Um, the board has kind of dodged the issue. We're seeking efficiencies. The board is always seeking efficiencies in this uh, district. Mm. They've dodged the issue of, of Roxbury, How so? the school in Roxbury. Ah. There was an agreement when we did the merger that we would revisit whether that micro school would stay a micro school. Tell me more about dodging the issue. I want to know what you mean by that before I... Well, and that's never really come to the fore as mm. to what should happen to oh. that. There's been discussion. Mm -hmm. I've heard discussion of a, of a magnet school mm -hmm. up there, perhaps, mm -hmm. that would try and attract families that want um, a different kind of elementary school education. Interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Perhaps like a Montessori style mm -hmm. that we could pick up more kids. But that school has very, very few students in it. Would you be in favor of opening that discussion, realizing that Rox that's part of the identity of Roxbury, the town, wow. is in that school? Okay, broadly, I am always in favor of conversation and discussion, always. Um, I think, first and foremost, that conversation has to be with Roxbury. But they're uh, part of a, a larger union now. They are now part of a larger union. Um, I do know that the policy committee um, in the school board has been examining each policy and finding a number of outdated policies um, and bringing them in line with um, the structure of the district that now includes Roxbury um, and, and making sure that that Roxbury as part of the district is more part of the, the fabric and the policies and, the, and what governs the district, um, that, that, that that integration is more consciously um, and thoughtfully made. Um, so I know that, so I don't believe that they've dodged the issue of Roxbury. I think the issue of Roxbury being part of the district is part of the constant daily work of the board right now. Um, that said, is, is Roxbury going to become something else, something interesting? Some, I mean, of course they're interesting. Something, something like a Montessori school, something like a magnet school. Is that, are those possibilities something that Roxbury is interested in um, that we again, are able to support? for the better for the entire district. It comes back but, to, again, the entire district versus that identity issue at that school. And Roxbury sure. is not the only town that has that issue of, of no, a small not. school that defines identity. They are not. But, you know, that, that's what I was asking. It's a partnership. And like, as with any partnership, it is, it is not for one partner to dictate what the other should do. Um, but the partnership is a whole thing. It is a complete district. Um, and, and 
So what, what we are able to build together that best serves the students is something I am not as only a potential board member um, and as a, someone who lives in Montpelier and not Roxbury, I am reluctant to make any pronouncements about what Roxbury should or should not do. Okay. Um, do you feel that the uh, pulling of the school resource officer was the correct decision by the board? Yes, and I was on the committee that examined that issue. Do you believe that in case of a school sh shooter ah. in the elementary school, without the kids knowing anyone in the police department, not having that central figure there, that okay. that would be as safe as having a central figure? Let's get into it. Um, the school resource officer. Um, I was on, I was brought into the subcommittee of the school board, the school safety and police relations committee. I served on that committee and worked closely with the school board in 2020 and 2021. Um, that's probably my primary qualification for serving on the school board proper is that I spent that time um, working on this committee of the school board and researching precisely this issue. And what we found was and this is, this is the connection everybody makes directly, having, having police and school shootings. And well, that's the ultimate tragedy. That's that the is, ultimate that emergency. is, and that is, the, that is the most visceral fear. That right. is the most, like anything, anything that makes schools safer when confronted with the possibility of school shootings, like all parents want that. Um, it's... On studying the issue, um, having an SRO does not protect a school from school shootings. And we have that from every study. And we have that from... What does the protect schools from school shootings? Separate like? question, but we're asking about okay. SROs. Um, and we have that from our own police department. Um, we have that from our former police chief. Uh, we have that from Chief Pete, who's our current police chief. Who, who very clearly said that protection from school shootings um, is not the reason to have an SRO. It is, it is not what was what the reason protect. for having an SRO? There were a lot of reasons. Creating the position um, was in many ways a knee-jerk response to Columbine. It had, was directly connected to school shootings. Um, what we have found since then is that, I mean, many, many tragedies and shootings at schools have occurred in schools that have a police officer present on campus. The one in Florida. That did, and there's, there's too many to count. Um, so it does not have a preventative effect. Um, we have found that, and this was really important. This is, okay, this is very, very important. Um, that what we found in studying the issue was that having a police officer on campus, um, and also we had, we had a police officer who was Bouncing between three campuses. I was just campuses. about to say they were on yeah. no one campus yeah. all day long. Yeah, they were not. They were not. So there wasn't that constant presence. Um, also, we found that there wasn't necessarily consistency in terms of um, if if a child who is a student in the district was through whatever unfortunate circumstance um, encountered law enforcement, the law enforcement officer they encountered was not necessarily the SRO, even in cases where the issue at hand happened on a particular campus. There wasn't necessarily this consistency, this one face, this one familiar um, face of law enforcement. Um, so that, I mean, that was often presented as an argument in favor of the position. It wasn't really the reality that our community in had encountered so far. Um, but setting that aside, this is, this is the issue. This is the single most important reason. Um, the evidence was unequivocal that the presence of an SRO on a school campus causes inadvertent harm regardless, I'll define that, regardless of the conduct of the officer. Um, one of the reasons the debate was so heated and charged was on the news every night we were seeing police brutality. I mean, we were seeing horrible police brutality. Um, many of it at schools, we were seeing students um, bullied and by officers 
in schools all over the country. Um, I mean, this the summer of 2020, we saw my old town, my neighborhood, on fire. Um, we saw George Floyd die. So that so was what the super. Came as that a was the super. To Columbine nope. left as a reaction to no. George Floyd. No, that was the superheated moment, and and everyone was saying rightly those things aren't happening here. We're not responding to, like there are no, like no one has YouTube footage of horrible police brutality in a Montpelier school. So why is this an issue here? Was the question. Um, and what studies have shown consistently is that the mere presence of a badge and a gun on campus, even when the conduct of the officer in question is exemplary, has an inadver inadvertent intimidating effect. So and we if saw that. Brian were to agree not to have the gun, if the gun were left in the principal's office, would that have been all right? Um, we actually asked that question of, and our, and our former I know Brian said that he wouldn't accept that. No, he said a, a police officer is armed. In the United right. States, a police officer is armed. So if you want a police officer on campus, they will be armed. Um, and they're period. wearing the if, vest, actually. And they're, I mean, they are in a, their capacity as police officer. So the question was, do we want and need a police officer on campus? And it's... In every study, Vermont Legal Aid has studied this for years, particularly the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid, and they put out a really important study in 2015 um, about the consequences of this, the consequences of having a police officer on campus, and the consequences for particular demographics, for kids with disabilities, um, for students of color, for LGBTQ students. Um, the consequences are devastating, and there is constant, the mere presence of a badge and a gun on campus. Um, given the history of law enforcement in this country, with particular demographics, it's, um, knowing that history, there is, it is intimidating. It is, and okay, just as a metaphor, let, let's look at it this way. Um, I mean, I have, I have back problems. I had spinal surgery a while ago. So a common question if you've got a serious back injury is, you know, surgery or physical therapy? Um, and many of the conversations around the presence of law enforcement on campus. <coughs> Excuse me. Blessings. Um, Start with many of them. Were very, um, are very, very similar. In a, that reminded me a great deal of the, um, like, do you go the surgical route for a problem that you're having? Do you like a more drastic and decisive intervention? Um, or do you do physical therapy? Do you strengthen other things? Um, and having, having a police officer patrolling the schools, which when the program was originally created was, um, it's in the language of the charter that created the SRO position in the city of Montpelier, that they would be watching for potential delinquency. So it was, it grew into something more community service minded, but its original intent was just um, policing kids all the time in their place of learning, looking for potential infractions. Um, that has a very bad effect on someone's ability to learn. Let me, let me go and a slightly so, different no, direction. No, 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 no. But I'm gonna finish my medical metaphor. Um, so having a, it was like having a surgeon at the physical therapy studio. Like you're going to do sit-ups and to strengthen your core muscles and to avoid surgery and there's a man with a scalpel and a surgical mask watching you. Now surgeons help people they spend their entire careers learning how to help people. So to say that that not, is not conducive to the environment of physical therapy is not to say anything bad about surgeons and doctors. Um, but it is a drastic intervention that shouldn't simply be hovering. Um, we found much the same thing with the presence of a police officer on schools. It has a chilling effect on the ability of students, certain vulnerable demographics of students in particular, their ability to learn at How all. How do those students learn to relate to the police? 
That is a much bigger question we've been no, asking is, for is that a of responsibility years. of the schools to sit for elementary school kids, for all elementary school kids, is it a responsibility of the schools to get these kids to meet with the police in a non-threatening way so that when the police are needed, these kids won't be afraid to approach the police? Short answer, if the police have a public relations problem in the United States, that is not the school's responsibility to solve, nor is the school able to solve it. It is, the responsibility of the schools is to the students. Okay. If there is something that the schools are doing that harms the students, it is the responsibility of the school to stop that thing. The police have uh, coffee with the police on the street, where sure. they go in front of a store and um, Mike Philbrick uh -huh. will get out there and talk to people on the Absolutely. street. How do you extend that to children? That, that, that reach out of the police and as a non-threatening presence. How should that, uh, how would you counsel parents to get your kids to get a positive view of the police department as protectors and friends? I have no answer to that question. And should I don't we believe, have I, I an don't answer believe, to that? I think we should absolutely, as a society and as a community, and as a town and as a city, um, be having these conversations about the role of the police. And in my experience, our police have been incredibly valuable members of those conversations and very willing to have those conversations. Um, Chief Pete has been outstanding um, in his engagement with the community and defining the role and his role and the role of his department in this community. Um, this, however, this is, I mean, this question is hundreds of years old. It is not the responsibility of the school board or of our schools to solve it on behalf of the police or on behalf of the city, for that matter. The responsibility of the school board is the education of the students and their well-being and their ability to take full advantage of that education. Um, so if like, these additional responsibilities and levels of engagement and conversations are important, um, we should not engage in them, engage, we should not do anything that compromises the student education. We have community-based learning in the high school. Mm -hmm. where the kids are, uh, if you're going to graduate from Montpelier High School, odds are that you've been out in the community involved in, in Matt McLean's program for community-based education, where we yes. put our Excellent. students as active members of the community. Yes, tremendously important. Uh, again, I come back and ask that question. You know, uh, the policing and the fire department are part of the core of the community. Mm -hmm. and, when, and that particular program, I am guessing, encounters other public servants and other modes of community service um, in its engagement with the community. And that engagement is important. And those dialogues are important. And understanding respective responsibilities are important. We have an equity committee on this, social equity committee on the board. Yes. Are you familiar with that? I am, yes. How do you see yourself vis-a-vis -vis that committee? If you were sitting on that committee, what would you be, what would be your priority be on that committee? I have done similar work before. I've done advocacy work here at the college. Um, Do we have a social equity problem in our schools right now? There, short answer, yes, always. We, we, have, equity, we have equity problems um, as a nation. We have, um, we have, there are a number of power dynamics that are always at play and should always be examined. Um, what would be a social equity issue in our schools? When our, our should son, I just pick one? Well, when our, our son went to Montpelier High School and yeah. the Gay Straight Coalition or Club or whatever it was was, was alive and thriving mm -hmm. 10 or 12 years ago, mm -hmm. what, what are social equity issues? I, I, 
maybe I'm just old fashioned, maybe I'm stuck 10 or 12 years ago in, in our school district, but we were addressing those a decade ago. Well, it's never, this kind of work is never done. I mean, it's never done. What, what are, what's an issue right now that's pressing? Oh, well, in a, there's in a social equity concern. Okay. Um, oh, God, what isn't? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's always um, questions of economic equity. I mean, there's always. Again, to transcend the school. Always. It transcends the school, but it affects the school and it affects student access to education. Like if. Um, so no, any, anything, anything. Yeah. If you're doing, you know, if you're doing a field trip, if you're doing a, a book drive, if you're, you know, Scholastic is has their their little catalog and kids are buying books. Um, any of the, any of the things that that happen at a school where um, there will be families who think nothing of giving their kids five dollars to have access to this thing, and there are families for whom that may be a much more significant ask or significant barrier. Where, um, where a random five dollars is not lying around to, um, to buy usually one of the things that isn't actually books uh, when, there's, when there's a book drive. Um, I mean, that is, um, that is an equity issue. That's an economic equity issue. That's, and in general, um, and this is not, like there's no, there's no villainy to this. It's just oversight. In general, people, who are making decisions, who are getting involved from the community, um, by and large, tend to be economically well off because there's spare time to volunteer Absolutely. for things. Absolutely. And so, we have tremendous parent volunteer we do. in our schools. We do. It's tremendous and it's great. And it's, it's the involvement and the community commitment to it is fantastic. There is usually, I mean, if you're working three jobs, you might have less time to volunteer for a thing. Um, so it is then incumbent upon whoever is making those decisions and those structural decisions about what we bring to the school, how students are able to participate in it, um, it might not occur to whoever is making those decisions that $5 is going to be a big deal. Okay, I can see that. So they have to think in terms of equity. You have to challenge yourself to think in terms of the barriers that you yourself don't necessarily experience. And that includes um, it, that includes any kind of power dynamic. That includes um, dynamics of race and gender. That includes um, dynamics of many genders. Um, that in, includes, and so I mean, the, the GSA continues to be alive and thriving. What is GSA? Year. Oh, the, um, it was formerly the Gay Straight Alliance. It's okay. now the, the the one that my son. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Years, it's now the years ago. the Gender and Sexuality a exactly. um, Alliance is. Um, and so it's no longer binary. So it's no longer gay straight alliance. Exactly. It's the gender and sexuality spectrum um, and constellation of of, uh, of of student experiences and student needs. And this, you have to be aware of these. You have to be aware of these um, from specifically an equity lens, because any one of us isn't necessarily going to notice where. Um, a particular part of the community or engagement with the schools or access to education um, has been compromised or denied, either deliberately due to the biases of the past or present, or just accidentally, or as an oversight. Um, those, it's always there to be addressed and corrected. Right now we have 14 kids at the Votech Center. Okay. Is that an equity issue for blue collar parents that so few kids are accessing direct lines to blue collar careers that might pay well and that lead to Votech colleges? Potentially. We should check. It's just curious. Yes. Um it is and, and it's and, and my answer is serious. I don't um my answer is that I don't know enough to answer the question, but I think it's an important question. And I think it's a question that should always be there as we look at the structure and dynamics of the schools. Um, what, what are the equity issues that we haven't even noticed yet? Um, and that's why the Social that Equity Committee 
is, is doing for that people work. to come to that committee and address their concerns. Exactly. So that the board is listening. Exactly. They may, I mean, they're not, the nature of that committee isn't to have those answers um, already. The, like, the, the work is to find what are the questions we haven't even asked yet. And that feeds into, into the vision committee yes. of how we would like to see our district envision itself. Yes. Where do we, where do we go from here? Well, I know where we go to here. We go to the end of the show. Thank you so Fantastic. much, Will, for appearing with me and for going over a broad range of topics you never dreamed you would discuss. And uh, thank you for watching the show. And I would hope that everyone who watches this will get out and vote. Oh, yes, And I'm not always. talking about town meeting day. I'm talking about before return the ballot. But if you haven't returned the ballot, March 1st is town meeting day. Watch the other shows and listen to the candidates and listen to... The, that Libby talk about the school budget mm -hmm. and listen to the mayor talk about the city budget and get out and vote. And thank you very much. Good evening.